Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the uh, the organizers of these webinars uh, ask, uh, inviting us to uh, to present. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to get some feedback on on a paper uh, that uh, we otherwise weren't expecting to get much feedback on. So this is uh, joint work with uh, Kevin Chen and Rick Lambert. It's a project that Kevin and I have been talking about for a, a couple of years. Uh, that came out of a few keynote addresses that I gave uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, and then we brought Rick Lambert on the, the paper that sort of just keep him busy and give him something to do. Kevin is a, a third year PhD student just finishing up his third year. So he'll be on the job market in a, a couple of years. Uh, so assuming the, the world is still around then you should look for him uh, on the job market. Um, so what I want to do today, I'm kind of, uh, you know, Kevin's setup man, I guess, kind of warm up the crowd. So I want to give a bit of perspective on sort of my thinking about a little bit about the state of the corporate governance literature, where I think we can do better, where I think we should be moving. Um, and then Kevin will get into the model itself. And, uh, you know, we're hoping to do some empirical tests. We hope other people will sort of follow on with this and, and do some empirical work as well. So just to lay the groundwork. So, you know, we're thinking of corporate governance as a, a set of complementary mechanisms that help align the actions and choices of managers with the interests of shareholders. And I don't think that's, that's particularly controversial. I mean, obviously there's, you know, people that have been discussing sort of stakeholder as opposed to shareholder governance, but, but I, I don't think the fundamental issues here are, are really different. So the, the agency conflicts that arise, uh, these obviously stem from a separation from ownership and control. So uh, for shareholders to be able to monitor managers would require a tremendous amount of time and effort and information that we just can't expect a broad group of shareholders to have. So they delegate decision rights to a board of directors who spend more time with management, more time with the firm, they have more specific expertise, they gather more information, uh, and they make some decisions, but they again delegate a lot of decisions to managers who have more sort of firm specific, uh, investment specific information. And so when they do all that delegation, then obviously there are gonna be situations where managers or directors take opportunistic actions that benefit them to the detriment of the shareholders. So, you know, firms have, uh, or I think about firms as being endowed with various types and levels of agency conflicts. And I think, you know, it's pretty intuitive what types of firms are gonna have more or less or different types of agency conflicts. Firms with different types of investment opportunities because a lot of what managers do is related to investment. Firms of different size, big firms, small firms are gonna have different kinds of agency conflicts. The history of the path dependence of the firm, whether there was a founding CEO and other sorts of things, maybe geographic issues, I mean, those are gonna play a, a big part. Uh, and then to what extent the information processing costs can be uh, handled, because obviously for shareholders and directors to make good decisions on governance, they need good information. So there's a variety of different things that companies do to solve these uh, agency conflicts. It's very complex, lots of moving pieces. These are some of the very common ones. So board structure, shareholder rights. So board structure would encompass things like independence and busyness and certain skills and connections. Shareholder rights, which have been discussed, staggered boards, allowing shareholders to vote on certain things. We get tons of papers on executive compensation equity incentives and pay levels and bonus plans and those sorts of things. Corporate compliance policies. So recently there's been a lot of research done on insider trading provisions, clawbacks, whistleblowing, those sorts of things. Various management practices with, with respect to succession or turnover, hiring, firing, culture issues, monitoring from outside investors and parties. So analysts and creditors, institutional investors, uh, the exchange listing regulators. And then the last one here, which is sometimes forgotten, but is really important, is information transparency. So to the extent that the firm is a black box, it's going to create a very different set of agency conflicts than will be created if the directors and the shareholders and even parties outside the firm, like creditors and analysts and the, the general public, have access to information that allows them to monitor management. So all these things are sort of playing at the same time. 
The three in red are the ones we're gonna focus on in our paper. So we're gonna focus on board structure, executive compensation and transparency. And Kevin's gonna come back to that when he starts the discussion. So what I'm trying to convey with these first few slides is that there's a, so I'm gonna call it a dizzying menu of mechanisms. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's very complex. It's very endogenous. So firms have you know, generally sort of just an ability to select from all these different, this menu of different mechanisms. Uh, there's gonna to be tons of complementaries and substitutes. I mean, we've got a little bit of research on that. So things like independent directors are gonna be more effective when transparency is high. CEO incentives could substitute for other forms of monitoring. Um, and then thinking about this path dependence, whether founder CEOs and other sorts of things in the corporate history influence what we see, but it's, it's extremely complicated. Um, so let, I wanna show you just a quick look at some governance data, just to kind of give you a sense for how the variety of different ways companies have to solve the same problem, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is to just, the thought experiment is, you know, if, if there really is sort of a, a, a better, best way for firms to construct, construct their governance mechanisms, then we should see that really successful firms are doing their governance in consistent ways and, and unsuccessful firms simply are, are not. And so to just give some sense for that, what Kevin and I have done is, is just you know, pulled all the firms uh, on uh, CRISP and CompuStat for a 10 year period. And, and we require the firms to be on the sample for the full period. So there's a selection issue there, but I don't think that's critical. And then within each industry, we picked the top 10 performers by cumulative stock return over that 10 year period. So the median firm, performs at 354% cumulative return over a 10 year period. So these are really good firms. And then we divide these firms into the top performers and everybody else and compare some common governance mechanisms. And, and if really good firms are doing things in a certain way that other firms aren't, we kind of should see some evidence of that in the data. And what we see is almost no evidence of that in the data, and virtually no evidence in the data. So the column on the left are your good performers, the column on the right is everyone else. Roughly the same size, roughly the same age. The ones on the left obviously have great returns compared to the ones on the right, but the governance mechanisms are pretty similar. So in terms of staggered boards, poison pills, dual class shares, CEO chairman duality, board size, tenure, busy directors, independents, you know, all, you know, CEO incentives, they're not that much different. Uh, and in fact, in many cases, you know, in, in other talks I've given, I've sort of taken the labels off the top and challenged the audience to tell me which column is which, and it's really hard to do. And the, and the only point of this is that there's lots of ways for firms to structure governance that's successful. And so that creates a particular challenge for us. So there's lots of different dials that companies have that they can turn with respect to governance. And there's lots of ways to turn those dials that lead to pretty darn good governance. And we have to come up with some way to understand that uh, as researchers. So what I would like to understand uh, is how do firms combine the array of available governance mechanisms to resolve those agency conflicts? So how do they make those choices? Uh, given that they have you know, 20 or 30 or 50 different decisions to make, how do they combine them? So ideally at the end of the day, and you know, we all sort of think immediately about what's causing what in our research these days. Ideally, we'd like to eventually make some causal statements like firms that are endowed with certain types of agency conflicts choose certain types of governance mechanisms to resolve those agency conflicts. However, we're a long, long way away from that end result. And my concern is that we don't really even, we don't seem to be trying to solve that problem. So I would view it as an opportunity as when I put together an earlier version of the slides, I called it sort of maybe a, a dis discouraging, but I changed it to being an opportunity because I think that's how you should view it. So I would say most studies, if you go back and look at the last five to seven years, maybe even 10 years of governance research, most studies fall into one of two buckets. Well, there's what I'm gonna call shock research, which I think you can immediately understand what that is. So we see some shock to some governance mechanism and we wanna be able to say what, you know, 
what, what, what actions are caused by what governance mechanisms. So we regress some action on some shock to governance that's caused by regulation or something else that's going on in the economy. But I don't quite see how that really helps us understand equilibrium behavior because almost by construction, these shocks have shocked a firm into a state of disequilibrium. And so if we have some regulatory shock that forces firms to have more independent directors on the board, they're gonna do a bunch of stuff for a while until they figure out how to get back into equilibrium. And what we tend to do is just study them while they're in disequilibrium. And that might tell us some stuff. It might tell us what firms are likely to do in the first few years after they're shocked out of equilibrium, but I'm not sure it gives us the big picture we want. The other group is sort of what I'll call best practices research. And that's where we see, see uh, scholars regress firm value or firm performance on some governance mechanisms. So they pick something like a staggered board or board independence, and they try to see or busy directors, and they try to see whether, is it good, is it bad, is firm value higher for firms that do this or that? But from just the few slides I've showed you, it should be clear that good and bad governance seems far too complex, at least to me, to be distilled into some conditional, unconditional, or even conditional statements about a single governance mechanism, like do busy directors, is that good or bad? It's just so many dials that firms are turning simultaneously. And unfortunately, 20 years ago, there was a, quite a bit of research on why firms and how firms choose governance mechanisms. Uh, but we don't do that kind of research very much anymore. So very little of the recent research focuses on how firms make the choices. Uh, and so the new direction, so I'm just going to go for another minute or so. The new direction I would suggest that we take here uh, is to first, you know, step back a little bit and, and allow a little bit more leeway for authors to understand this complex problem. So first, let's try to model how firms are expected to combine these mechanisms to resolve agency conflicts. And you know, Kevin and I have tried to do that, and Rick have tried to do that in his paper. Other people have tried to do it you know, with other mechanisms, so I think that's important. Examine whether firms use governance mechanisms consistently with a theory to resolve the agency conflicts. Uh, and then examine the con consequences of off equilibrium behavior. So only once we understand sort of how firms seem to be, how most firms seem to be doing it, in equilibrium to solve certain problems. And we can kind of look at firms that are maybe off equilibrium and see whether maybe they are making a bad decision or something like that. So we can study that, but I think first we need to understand the, the, the bigger picture. So I'm gonna argue that we should allow authors the opportunity to document equilibrium choices, correlations, complements, substitutes, understand the structure of the data and how do firms endogenously choose these things. Endogeneity is not something we should always be trying to control for. It's something that we should try to understand. So just controlling for it sort of throws the baby out with the bathwater, at least my view with respect to governance. So I would caution against forcing authors in every paper on governance to document some causality or performance effects, uh, but rather allow authors some leeway to understand the, the structure of the data because it's very complicated and to do something, to, to really get down to, to causality or good and bad, you really need to understand, I think, understand what firms are doing a little bit better than we do now. So with that, uh, take it away, Kevin. All right, thanks very much, Wayne, and the organizers of this great seminar. Um, is my screen showing? Yep. Okay, great. So hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Chen, and um, it's great to be here to talk about and, and to have this opportunity to present our research. So. Um, I'll just continue on Wayne's presentation by talking a bit more about what we do in the paper. So in this paper, we try to explore some of the theoretical issues um, that may arise when firms have to select multiple governance mechanisms simultaneously. And so specifically, we develop a model of multidimensional governance centered around three governance choices, the board's independence, the CEO's equity incentives, and the board's expertise. So these governance mechanisms tie back to monitoring, advising, incentives, and transparency, which I think are at the heart of corporate governance. So through our model, we explore the interactions and trade-offs between these mechanisms um, with the goal of providing new insights into how firms 
can combine the array of available governance mechanisms to resolve agency problems. So to give you a sense of interactions and trade-offs that we examine, um, so consider a setting where the CEO has to decide whether or not to take an investment project. And there's also a board that may potentially monitor and advise on the project. So there are two potential agency frictions here. There's an incentive friction um, where, where the CEO may select wrong investment projects because of private benefits. There's also an information friction where the CEO may not be willing to share information with the board, which limits the board's ability to effectively monitor and advise. So to illustrate some of the trade-offs at work, let's start from board independence. So a more independent board um, will be able to monitor the CEO and take away his private benefits. And so this alleviates the incentive friction, but then the CEO is less willing to share information with the board. One way to provide incentives for the CEO to share information with the board is to have independent directors with high expertise. So the higher expertise makes board advising uh, more valuable to the CEO. And since board advising can be effective only if the CEO shares information, high board expertise will encourage the CEO to share information with the board. However, high board, board expertise can also be costly. Um, so for example, one approach firms may take towards increasing the expertise of the board is to add more directors. But as has been shown in the literature, coordination costs can arise um, that, can that can constrain the board's effectiveness. And so this brings us to the third mechanism to the CEO's compensation contract, and in particular, his equity holdings in the firm. So in our model, equity incentives can help address both the investment and information frictions, all right? So a higher equity state provides another incentive together with board expertise for the CEO to make the right project choice when board independence is low. And it also provides another incentive, again, together with board expertise, for the CEO to be willing to share information um, when board independence is high. Um, however, incentive compensation is costly and involves giving up the shares of the project's terminal payout. Um, so, so as a result, equity incentives on their own um, may not be an efficient mechanism. The key is that they have to be combined with other governance mechanisms. So what are the main contributions of the paper? So I think there are three main contributions. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first paper to study a model where board independence, board expertise, and CEO equity incentives are all endogenously determined. By doing this, we address one of the difficult issues in corporate governance, which is how to get the CEO to share information with the board. Um, so previous studies have shown that by reducing uh, board independence, it's possible to achieve information sharing between the CEO and board. But independence has other costs. And what we show is how to use three governance mechanisms together jointly to solve the problem. Um, furthermore, our model provides new empirical predictions about how different governance mechanisms cluster together. For example, we document a relation between board expertise and equity incentives that has not been studied before. So of course, we're not the first to examine some of these issues. There's a large theoretical and empirical literature in corporate governance. Our paper ties primarily to three strands of literature, the literature on board independence and monitoring, um, the literature on board expertise, and as well as several theoretical and empirical papers on governance interactions. All right, so now I'll just talk about the model. So there's going to be a risk neutral CEO that's hired by the firm to decide whether to take a new investment project or take the default project. For example, the new investment project might be entering a risky new market. Um, the new investment project can benefit from the board's advice, but it also gives the CEO an opportunity to obtain private benefits delta. The default project does not benefit from the board's advice but also the CEO has no opportunity to obtain private benefits. Uh, the profitability of the new investment project is uncertain and the CEO has private information about the quality of the investment opportunity. 
The CEO then decides whether or not to disclose information about the new project to the board. Uh, and if he does, the project can benefit from the board's advice. And additionally, the information the CEO chooses to disclose to the board can help the board monitor the CEO. And monitoring here just means taking away private benefits. So the board's monitoring intensity will be a function of its independence. So a board can have a high or low independence where only a high independence will monitor the CEO. And so, so far, the features of the model discussed are fairly standard, including the assumption that disclosure, disclosure is needed for the board to effectively monitor the CEO and advise about the new investment project. The first new feature of our model is that expertise here is an endogenous choice made by shareholders. Um, so since there are no agency frictions uh, between the board and shareholders in our model, one can interpret this as the board itself selecting directors that will maximize the value of the advising. Now the value of the board's advice depends on both the CEO's willingness to disclose information about the project and the board's ex ante expertise. And specifically the quality of advising has the following quadratic functional form. So this functional form um, captures the idea that the advising benefits increases with board expertise but only to a certain point. And so one can think about many different empirical measures of board expertise that have this feature. So for example, adding directors to the board improves the expertise, but there may be higher costs to communicate with more directors, limiting the quality of the vice. Um, so similarly, a firm might pursue directors with very particular industry expertise, but the more specialized this expertise becomes, the more likely it may not match the needs of the project. The second new feature of our model is the dual role of equity incentives. So in the model, shareholders offer the manager equity incentives in the form of a fixed share beta of the project's terminal value. And so how do equity incentives serve a dual role here? Well, first they motivate the CEO to make the right investment decision because he cares more about the investment's return. The second role, which is what is more novel, is that equity incentives motivate the CEO to disclose to the board. Um, this is the result of two forces. First, uh, equity incentives make the CEO care more about the value of the board's advice. And second, uh, the CEO can only obtain the board's advice by disclosing his own information. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, equity incentives are going to be costly and involve giving up shares of the project's terminal payout. So the efficient governance arrangement will involve coupling them with other governance mechanisms, namely board independence and board expertise. So here's the timeline of events. So first the firm or shareholders select a governance structure G, which is a triplet containing board independence gamma, equity incentives beta, and board expertise lambda. So clearly here, uh, this governance choice is multidimensional. Uh, next, the CEO is gonna privately observe S, which is the state of the world that determines the profitability of the new investment project. The CEO then chooses investment policy I and disclosure policy D. If the CEO discloses, then the board can provide advice and monitor the CEO. And then finally, the payoffs are realized. So we have three main results, which I will discuss next. So our first main result is about the interaction between board expertise and board independence. So we find that in equilibrium, a board has high independence if and only if it also has high expertise. So the intuition for this result is that an independent board needs the CEO to share information in order to effectively monitor and advise. The CEO is only willing to disclose if Lambda, the board's expertise is high enough, where the benefit he receives from the board's advising exceeds the private benefit he gives up by disclosing. Um, if it's too costly to acquire high expertise, then the firm is better off choosing to have a low independence board. A low independence board preserves information flow from the CEO to the board so that even though the board cannot monitor, 
um, it may still provide some advice and benefits. And so one thing to note is that this is not a causal relation as both expertise and independence are endogenous choices here. So testing this prediction does not require estimating any causal effects, but can be tested by examining correlations. Specifically, the model would predict that board expertise and board independence will be positively related, both cross-sectionally and over time. So board expertise in this case should be measured by the proportion of independent directors that have high expertise, not the proportion of the board. So this is consistent with the interpretation of Lambda in our model as the expertise of just the independent directors. Um, so I think that th our model then has some implications for how um, researchers might measure the board's expertise in the data. And so DAS AL 2014 find a positive relation between board independence and the proportion of directors with related industry experience, which is consistent with the model's prediction. Our second main result is about the interaction between board expertise and equity incentives. So board expertise and equity incentives are substitutes when the board has high independence. And the reason for this is that higher expertise makes the board's advice more valuable and so less incentive compensation is needed to motivate disclosure. And so more broadly, this result speaks to the information and incentive roles of corporate governance. So the information role is gonna focus on how governance enables the CEO to become more informed, while the incentive role focuses on how governance aligns the CEO's incentives with shareholders. So this result shows that there's an interaction between the two when board expertise is higher, the board can provide more information to the CEO, reducing the need for the provision of incentives. Um, and so in contrast, when the board has low independence, board expertise and equity incentives are positively related. So the relationship flips. And the reason is just that the CEO is willing to disclose to a low independence board, but the absence of monitoring gives the CEO incentives to choose the project that gives him private benefits even when it's not efficient. Um, so in this case, higher board expertise is counterproductive because it makes the new project more attractive, where shareholders pref prefer the CEO to not take the project in the first place. Our third main result is on the equilibrium relation between board independence and equity incentives. So the standard argument in the literature is that when the board has high independence, there's more monitoring which reduces the need for equity incentives. However, this argument ignores the fact that the CEO may not be willing to share information with the independent board, preventing effective monitoring. Um, so, so our model tries to capture this idea and shows that this has implications for the way that equity incentives are going to be designed in equilibrium. And so specifically, we find that now equity incentives um, may have a negative or positive relation uh, with independence. And moreover, whether the relation is positive or negative depends on the equilibrium levels of board expertise. So when the level of board expertise is high, the value of the board's advice is greater. And so it's less difficult to motivate disclosure, implying lower equity incentives in equilibrium for a high independence board. Uh, meanwhile, a low independence board chooses higher equity incentives because high expertise can make the investment agency friction more severe. Okay, so one way to conceptualize this result is um, suppose you drew a subsample of firms from a larger cross sectional population of firms. Um, and, that, and next, suppose you could empirically measure the expertise of outside directors for the firms in the subsample and for the firms in the population. If the average board expertise in the subsample is greater than the average expertise in the population, then this result says that the negative relation between independence and equity incentives should be more pronounced in the subsample. Um, yeah, and so this is gonna, in contrast, this is gonna be flipped when the level of board expertise is low. So here, lower expertise, board expertise, implies that a firm with high independence will have to use more equity incentives in order to motivate disclosure. While a, a firm with a low independence board, uh, the, the investment agency friction will be less severe 
so that lower equity incentives will be required. Okay? So what are the implications of this result? So that most of the empirical literature on the relation between independence and equity incentives finds a negative relation. Um, our model provides some new insight into this empirical evidence. So recall that in our model, a negative relation between independence and equity incentives um, occurs if and only if the equilibrium levels of board expertise are relatively high. Hence, the fact that we mostly observe a negative relation suggests that firms on average have high board expertise and boards provide valuable advice. And so this shows how we can use the equilibrium relations between governance mechanisms to shed light on the board's advisory and strategic effectiveness. So to conclude, um, we develop a model of multidimensional governance. So to study their interactions and equilibrium relations. Um, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first study to allow board independence, board expertise, and CEO equity incentives um, to all be endogenously determined. So some of the key implications of the model are that first, to foster information sharing efficiently between the CEO and board, the firm needs to combine the use of multiple governance mechanisms. Second, how the firm designs the CEO compensation contract um, may have broad implications for the design of board structure through the contract's interaction with board advising. And finally, um, the model takes a step towards providing uh, a unified theory uh, for how various governance mechanisms cluster together. And so thank you, and thank you to the organizers of this webinar um, for giving us this opportunity to share our research. Thank you, Wayne and Kevin. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. So now we will switch to the Q&A uh, section. And the first question is from Shu. Hey, um, so um, it's a very nice presentation. I, I think it's a you know, very important, very big question, but at the same time, it's, it, it's very difficult. So um, I just have like a couple of questions about assumptions. So first is in the model, you assume that, I think there are two implicit assumptions if, if my understanding is correct. So first is the CEO always communicates truthfully to the uh, board of directors about the private information. And then the second assumption is if the CEO says nothing and the board of directors ba basically is, is kind of just beliefs that you know there is no information even though you know they could possibly infer that if you don't tell me information maybe your information is bad you know some, something like that seems not to be there i mean just my understanding is that correct yeah and so that's kind of the assumption about disclosure is that it will be truthful disclosure and then disclosure is non-verifiable so it can't be contracted on so that's the assumption about the disclosure in the model, yeah. Okay, okay, because I see. Because one, one thing is even if it's, um, even if it's private information, you can still like a design a contract such that you just, you know, you, you, you let the uh, CEO communicate. So your contract could be based on equity incentives, could be, could be based on the communicated information. And then you add another like truth telling constraint in a sense that, you know, the CEO doesn't have, has no incentive to lie based on the contract. The, the reason I'm thinking about that is because I think some of your results are, are kind of driven, you know, I use this equity mechanism. So, you know, even though, even, even though I want to invest because I'm giving the CEO a lot of equity, so it turns out to be, to be too expensive for me. But in a sense, if you, if you contract on the, um, if you contract on the reported earnings, one way you can do that is I don't give you equity. I just give you a plain wage. It covers basic is enough to satisfy your outside option plus your, um, plus your uh, private benefit. So in that case, you tell me you have no incentive to lie. You just tell me the, the truthful information. And then, you know, I, I, and then I can get, you know, the, the, the rest of whatever value is created. That might be cheaper than just paying by pure equity. Yeah, so that's, that's a very good point that we do make certain, uh, very specific assumptions about kind of the disclosure in our model and also kind of the information benefit, right? It's, very, it's modeled in a very stylized way, I guess, to make, to make the, the results transparent. And so I think the main thing is that we do assume that the disclosure is non-verifiable in this case. And so it's really kind of communication between 
um, the, the CEO and board, it's not going to be kind of disclosure based on earnings. And so mm -hmm. for that reason, um, the, the, we kind of abstracted away from kind of including disclosure in the contract. And so this is consistent with also um, some of the prior model. They, try, they tend to kind of view this disclosure or communication um, between the CEO and board as non-verifiable and so non-contract. I see. I see. Because because I was I'm thinking you know if you if you really think about you know some sort of like a verifiable like earnings, and then you know and then you could maybe shed some light on you know how much how much weight do you put on earnings versus how much weight do you put on equity and how does that interact with uh, corporate governance with board expertise and independence? Maybe you can get some you know additional implications. But I I agree that it's probably going to be more difficult. Okay. Yeah. We'll just, that. I just want to add something to that. So I, I think it's useful to just think about and those are good points, but useful to think about what kind of information we're talking about here. So, you know, we're talking about discussions between a CEO and a chief operating officer with a board of directors about a menu of projects that the firm might take over the next one to three years and providing information about expected future cash flows and what those opportunities are and, and hiring issues and capital outlays and I mean, it's a really tough thing to contract around uh, or contract on, I should say. So, you know, it's a, I think a much more complicated problem than, and Kevin can always tell me just to shut up here, but it's an always a complicated problem, more complicated than just, you know, if, if I do or don't disclose a certain piece of information, the board can infer something. I mean, it's, it's really a complicated issue. Um, and so it, it seems hard to put that in a contract, but. I mean, it's certainly something to think about. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have the next question. Uh, and my question is about, you know, what you said a little bit in, in, in the introduction, and maybe this is just, you know, the right position question. So basically say that, you know, in equilibrium, you expect to see this positive relation uh, between board expertise and uh, board independence. And I understand, you know, one side to this, so when you have, uh, more independence would have more expertise, but this way this will force or, you know, will make CEOs more likely to seek advice from the board. Now, what's a little bit unclear to me is the other side. So, I mentioned, well, if you have a low expertise, because expertise is costly, then some firms may benefit from low independence. And this is somewhat unclear because, you know, and, and, but, and you say, well, they may benefit from low independence because then CEOs are more likely to talk to the board. But if the board has looked expertise in the first place, right? What is the value of the CEO talking to the board in these cases? That's what be a little puzzling to me. Yeah, and so I think the way to think about expertise is kind of it's a continu it's on a continuous spectrum. So you have firms with lower potentially lower board expertise, and you have firms with um, potentially higher board expertise. And so I would say that even though there's a firm may have lower board expertise, it seems reasonable to believe that um, the CEO may benefit still by, by communicating to that board. And so even though there's a low, uh, there's a firm with low board expertise, right, it doesn't mean that there's no benefit in having this communication. It's just that this benefit is less. And so I think that's kind of how I would think about their different uh, levels of expertise. No, it makes sense. Also, I have a related question. Do you think there is some sort of a trade-off a little bit between expertise and independence? Because once you want to have more independent people on the board, maybe it's higher, you know, to get, you know, high expertise in some sense. Right? Because maybe of the, you know, pool of people you're trying to get in the board, or maybe they're a little bit less committed to the firm, right? Uh, do you think that there is some sort of, you know, trade-off between independence? And yeah, so... I think one natural way that you might think about a trade-off, but it's not the case in this model. Yeah, I know, that, I, know, I know that. Yeah, it's not, it's not the two model. Yeah. yeah, and so if you have higher independence, that means basically you're having less insider directors by, by, by definition. You have less inside directors. And if we think about kind of inside directors as having valuable expertise, then that's going to be kind of this trade-off, right? But how we're thinking about expertise in our model is really the expertise of independent directors. So it's, it's not kind of the whole board, it's among the subset of independent directors. And so that's kind of how the choice of independence and expertise can be separate 
And so what we show is that there's actually this kind of complementary relation. But I would, I would certainly agree that you know, the more independent directors you want to add to the board, each additional one, you just have to go down a list, right? So if I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to have the bare minimum independent directors to meet the regulatory standard of a, of a majority independent board. And then I think, okay, well, beyond that, I want to add another one and another one and another one. And I want to get to the point where the only inside director on the board is the CEO, which a lot of firms have. So to, to do that, I've got to bring in more and more independent directors and each subsequent one is going to have either less expertise or different expertise, but, but certainly there's going to be some trade-offs between you know, bringing in more and more independent directors and, and making sure they're at the same quality in terms of expertise. I think that's fair. Yeah, thank you. I'm just always thinking about you know, how we would test this empirically, right? Yeah, yeah. no, that's good. But thank you. So our next question is from uh, Seyu. Um, hi, Ben. Hi, Kevin. Thank you for your presentation today. I really like the idea that you look at multiple endogenous corporate attributes in the equilibrium. So my question uh, is about like in practice. So CEO may have the power to control the director selection process. So in this case, it's not the shareholder, but the CEO who decided the monitoring and advisory levels. So I'm wondering maybe uh, you could add some, another extension to add CEO's ability or bargaining, bargaining power into the model and to look at two situations. So in the first situations, uh, the CEO's ability is high so they can choose better projects and have the bargaining power so they can also decide the board monitoring and advisory level while shareholder decide the equity incentive and in the second situation, the, CD, the CEO ability is not high and the shareholder have to decide the monitoring, advisory and the equity incentive and to compare these two situations. So I think this can help to address the concern about um, who decided the director selection process in practice. Yeah, and so that, that's a really good point to you. So that's something we actually hadn't thought about, about um, kind of, we, we had really assumed that it was either the shareholders that are selecting the directors or the board that itself is selecting directors because in this case, shareholders and directors don't have any agency problems. Yeah. But now if we think about the CEO as being in charge of kind of, uh, of selecting directors and choosing the independence levels and advising levels potentially, um, mm -hmm. then, then I think that's, that, that might be a useful extension that we can look at. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly the case that in the governance literature, I mean, most papers that look at agency conflicts, you know, if you think about the CEO, the board and shareholders, most papers either assume that the board and shareholders are aligned, and mm -hmm. it's the CEO that's got the agency conflicts, or the CEO and the board are aligned because the board is captured by the CEO and they together have agency conflicts with the shareholders. So certainly in this paper, we've taken the first perspective where the board and the shareholders are aligned. Um, and then I'll leave it to Rick and Kevin to figure out whether we can <laughs> relax that assumption. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So the next question is from Yuni. Uh, hi, Wayne. Hi, Kevin. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed this. Uh, and my question is, do you consider to look into trace difference between unitary uh, versus dual class board? Because dual class board might have a more clear cut separation of the advising and monitoring function. Uh, and in that case, management board mm -hmm. and Advisory board can have different access to CEO's revelation of private information so that the information sharing story could be a little different. So do you consider to look into that? Um, so, so far, the main mechanisms we've looked at are kind of board expertise, um, board independence, and also CEO equity incentives. Um, we've considered kind of extending the model to other, other governance mechanisms. Um, we haven't particularly considered dual class shares yet. Um, I, we, we've considered extending it to things like when the CEO has additional power, so when the CEO is chairman, and it's actually pretty easy to extend the model to those cases. Um, as far as kind of dual class shares, I'd have to think, we'd have to think a bit more about how to endogenize that. I think that would be the uh, difficulty, but right now it, it's not currently 
uh, part of the uh, model? That's a, it, that's a great question because it just highlights the complexity of all this. So, you know, most of these dual class firms arise from founders that have essentially control at some point and they may release that over time or they may not. So there's a lot of firms that have dual class shares where the founders are still effectively in control. And for those firms, the notion of board independence really doesn't make any sense. And those firms don't even have to comply with a majority board independence in most cases. So, you know, now you're, you're looking, and I sort of mentioned this a little bit in my slides that, you know, there can be sort of these legacy issues with companies that really influence governance. So where there's a founder that has voting control, now that kind of firm has to figure out a way to structure the other governance mechanisms to sort of optimize but also recognizing that at some point down the road that founder might relinquish control and then are there going to be these sort of is stickiness in the governance you know, going forward so these are really complicated problems and questions like this just highlight that we've got to come up with a variety of research methods, techniques, and be flexible in how much we expect people to be able to do in a single pace. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I will skip to Manuel's question. And uh, Salma, can you please ask your question? Hi, hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting, very interesting paper. Uh, and it's good to see an analytical paper that tries to add a lot more complexity and try to, uh, to understand a little bit more about how things might be done in practice. So my question is about your assumption uh, about uh, the um, advice that uh, you get from the expertise. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just thinking, is this really realistic in practice uh, that the, the uh, board will not provide any new advice from the baseline project, but they will be only giving advice on the new project. So can you maybe explain a little bit more about this, how it might happen in practice, and, uh, and what would happen if you uh, change this assumption? Will it affect the result that you get in your uh, paper? Yeah, and so I think part of that, that's, you, you highlighted one of the challenges is taking kind of a real world setting and then I'm kind of translating it into a model. And so um, kind of, we've tried to capture some of that by stylistically assuming there are certain projects that um, are going to be more risky and that are going to require um, more expertise or outside advice from directors. And then we have like more of a default project that's going to have require less of that. But and then at the same time, the project that kind of requires more advice is going to also have um, more, uh, more opportunities for the CEO to potentially extract rents or funds um, for his own use. And that's why we kind of modeled the, the project with the advising and monitoring and the private benefits kind of together. As far as kind of the board providing advice, um, it's, it's the case that the board always provides advice on any of the project. In fact, that's kind of one of the features of the model is there's this kind of commitment to providing advice. So once the CEO goes down the line and chooses the project, um, the board will always provide advice on, on the project. We just assume that the advice is gonna be greater for one of the projects and less for the other projects. And in this case, just for simplicity, we assume that the advising benefit, benefit is gonna be zero for the other project. But we certainly could, could um, extend the model where where the advising benefit is non-zero for that other project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is from Emmanuel. Hey, thanks. Uh, so I just had a question on the information sharing. So it seems like the, the governance mechanisms in place kind of seek to encourage that information sharing in sort of different scenarios. But I was just wondering sort of how to think about that. And I know Wayne actually kind of touched on this before. Um, in response to an earlier question, but what's sort of the information sharing you, you, you have in mind and then sort of empirically, is this something observable that, you know, we can actually look at to sort of examine and, and things like that. So it was a sort of public, private, it's a, you know. I see. Yeah, so I guess the, yeah, ideally we would have a more kind of, obviously the communication kind of game between the board and the CEO is quite complex and some papers really 
um, emphasizes complexity. Um, in, in our case, we chose to have a very stylized information benefit, but we did initially try to model with a more kind of complex information disclosure where the CEO has some private information, it's communicating to the board, which has complementary information, and that by combining these two information, they were able to make, the CEO is able to make better investment choices. And so we did have a more kind of uh, sophisticated, I guess, uh, information disclosure, but uh, for tractability, we wanted to kind of emphasize the, the relations between equilibrium relations, which are kind of the main insights of the paper. And so that's why we kind of made the information disclosure game a little bit more stylized. And as far as kind of empirically measuring it, I would say that it's probably difficult to um, develop empirical measures that directly capture the information benefit. Um, so kind of the way, I guess, to test the model is to look at the, the observed governance choices of the firm, of the firm, of the cross section of firms, rather than kind of the, 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 the in, in particular, the communications between the, the CEO and board. But may, maybe Wayne has some other comments. Sure, I'll give you some other comments. Uh, so, so I agree with everything Kevin said. I think empirically, this is a really challenging issue, and, but and it's a well-known challenging issue. So it's been around for a while, and not to sort of highlight my own work, but what the heck, might as well do it. If you go back and look at the survey paper in the JE that I did with Chris Armstrong and Joe Weber on sort of governance and information transparency, financial transparency. We've got a few sections in there that kind of highlights this issue. So, you know, you, you imagine that, you know, it could be the case that CEO communicates with the board and nothing is ever publicly disclosed. And if that's the case, it's going to be really tricky to measure a CEO that's being very transparent with the board, but not transparent with people outside of the firm. And what some authors have argued, and there's a handful of papers we cite there, and I kind of believe this too, is that you know, a CEO that's being transparent with the board is going to be willing to be, you know, not with respect to proprietary information, but with respect to things that are going to mitigate agency conflicts and, and monitoring, right, then you would expect the CEO to be more transparent sort of externally as well. So, you know, a set of independent, yeah. independent directors are really time constrained. They can't kick the tires the way that an analyst can, the way a block holder can, the way you know financial media can. And so to the extent that the firm wants to, or a creditor can, to the extent that CEO wants to show that it's being transparent with the board, one way to do that might be to be transparent with people outside the firm and say, hey, if I'm doing anything I shouldn't be doing, I'm gonna make sure that every analyst figures it out, that the financial press is all over me like a watchdog, all these other sorts of things. Um, so it, it would be difficult to solve that problem if the CEO was, was closed mouth to everybody other than the board. But I think probably there might be, there would be ways to sort of tease out whether the CEO is worried. About yeah, that's, the yeah. that's what I was thinking. If you sort of spill over into more transparency in terms of their external financial reporting. If that's yeah, like I think so. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. So Fabrizio and I have questions, but we'll let Andrea go first. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for letting me skip the queue there. Um, so I think I guess I was wondering because this this idea of especially founder CEO has come up that you often have CEOs with substantial equity endowments. It can also come up in the in the case of um, you know inside hires who have worked at the firm for a long time. And I was just wondering if you looked kind of changing the order if a CEO comes in with an endowment, how that might affect things. Cause I think that is a fairly common issue that, that comes up at firms. I mean, I know the general thought would be it lessens the agency conflict, but I just didn't know if it would affect this uh, expertise versus independence relation. Yeah, it's certainly the case. So we're, the way we're thinking about this model is we're thinking about, you know, the hired CEO or the board can really control the amount of equity incentives that the CEO has. So if you've got a founder CEO, that's got a ton of equity, um, you know, even if it doesn't give that CEO any voting control, if they've got you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of equity, it's hard to change that dial. So, you know, I showed you a bunch of dials earlier. Some of those dials are gonna have a lot of frictions depending on the firm. And so, you know, we're gonna need to think about how this firm with this really sticky governance mechanism 
would respond to these sorts of things. So, you know, and it also might apply to a CEO that was hired from the outside, but who has been there for 15 years or 20 years, and they've accumulated $500 million worth of stock. You know, can you really play around with that dial anymore? And so, you know, thinking about how that firm would then move the other dials that they can move to make, to make adjustments is, is part of this complex problem. Right. Thank you. Um, so I guess we have Fabrizio asking a question next. Yes, Thanks, guys, for uh, uh, presenting this uh, this paper. I, I don't really have a question, more a, more a comment. I'm trying to think loud about you know how, how do you test empirically these things and all the challenges. And it seems one of the challenges in, when you think about this um, idea of clusters of governance is that we kind of assume that each governance mechanism performs one role. What is there is a clear role associated with it. Uh, Whereas probably each of them has, you know, multiple roles. For example, you know, when one of your early slides, you mentioned equity incentives can help with both growth, both the incentive and the information sharing. And one could stop there and say, well, if equity incentives help with incentive, with, uh, sorry, if they help with both incentives and information sharing, why do we need boards, right? So there has to be something about each of these things either serving a different role or not being able to fulfill that role to the extent required, right? That the equity incentives can only help with information sharing up to a certain point. Uh, because otherwise, you kind of you know you kind of say at some point, why do we have eight different mechanisms in governance that all can help with information sharing? All of them can help with incentives. And once once you think about adding more mechanisms to this, I mean this is already fairly you know, complex, but if you start adding more of them, each of them pretty much will overlap to some extent with the others in their role, right? So I, I was trying to think how, how you guys think about that, because empirically, of course, uh, that will all come together, you know, that, 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 that overlap in some sense. So, you know, when you start to do the slide showing good, go, um, good performance, bad performance, and there's no clear distinction in governance, I kind of suspect that for most combinations of governance mechanisms, you will probably still see very little difference. I mean, we'll see when, when the pickle test come out. And I think it's because, you know, we, we need to in some sense establish how much each mechanism can help with that problem so that we have a reason for multiple mechanism, mechanisms to deal with. So it, it just reflects a comment on that, yeah. on the challenge of this. You know, Fabrizio, I was, I was jealous of where you are, but then I realized that every wave is exactly the same that comes in behind you. And so I, I <laughs> realized I'm not as jealous as I thought. So that's certainly a good point. I mean, if you think about something like equity incentives, you know, basically what you're doing is you're trying to tie the guy's wealth to the stock price. And there's, you know, the stock price is only going to aggregate information. So the stock price is going to aggregate information about a lot of things beyond just the CEO's performance. And it's also the case that, you know, the CEO doesn't bear every dollar, of, you know, CEOs extracting private benefits. They're not bearing the full cost of those private benefits they're extracting. Some of it's being borne by the other shareholders. So, you know, obviously the different mechanisms are, going to overlap. Now, when, when you said, I be, I'm curious, when you said sort of, when I showed you those two columns of sort of the good performers, the other performers, and the fact that the, you know, just unconditionally or conditionally just on that, they, they don't look any different. And then you said something about how you think that they would be different if you did different things. I think what you were saying is if you if you combine them in certain buckets, that maybe you would see that the strong performers do certain combinations differently than others. Uh, and if that's well, I, what you were saying, I fully agree with that. We just need to understand what those combinations are. No, my concern is, is that if multiple mechanisms all help with the same construct, you know, constructs in this case, in your paper was providing incentives and information sharing, right? And if you argue that certain features of the boards can help with information sharing, but equity incentives can help with that as well, and maybe having you know a two tier, two tier board rather than unitary board can help as well. When you take it to the data, the combinations can can be can be optimal. Are going to be many, so unless you have a way to establish that, um, you know, in other words, the combination is more about the combination of information and incentives than the combination of the underlying provisions because. I might not be able, you know, I may not be able to find results 
supporting your prediction if there is another mechanism out there that also can help solve those problems. Or if equity incentives serve a third different purpose and boards serve a different purpose as well, which is the one to you know, institutionally represent shareholders and yeah. give continuity. So I mean, empirically it becomes really, you know, I mean, I, I like that you guys are taking that challenge, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's gonna be hard unless we have a clear sense of the constructs first that we want to capture and then say, okay, you know, all these mechanisms could be the same. And then, then I can construct clusters that make more sense given the, the construct as opposed to just have, you know, 100 provisions with, you know, 6,000 different clusters, right? Because that- I completely agree with yeah. that. And, and so, you know, I agree that, that they, they're solving, some of them are solving similar problems, some of them are solving yeah. different problems. There might be, you know, like those dials I showed you, there might be yeah. 27 different settings that all get you to the same place. And so if we're going to understand that, we better get started sooner than later. Yeah. <laughs> and we're way behind the eight ball. So we've got, you know, 500 governance papers that have been written over the last 10 years, and none of them try to do what you're talking about, or even what I'm talking about. So, you know, this sort of governance literature where we just take one little thing like busy directors and see whether it's related to Tobin's Q. I mean, that's kind of fun, but it's not, I don't think, helping us answer the big questions that you're talking about. What combinations of these mechanisms solve similar problems, different problems? I mean, I think we got to sort of hike up our britches and, and get moving. All right. We are running late, but I suggest we still carve some time for one more question because it's very much related from Miguel. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, Wayne. Uh, hi, Kevin. Uh, I was uh, sort of thinking about this problem uh, similar to Fabrizio. Imagine that we are observing a poker game uh, going on over several rounds for several players, right? And all we observe are combinations of cards, right? And then if we observe a significant number of games, we will see that a two is more, less likely to be a winner than a king and so on. But really, the value is not in the additive combinations. The, the value is in the, in the sort of interaction effects, right? After a while, we will discover that three of a kind are better than uh, two of a kind. And then later, uh, a, a flush will be better than that. So I think empirically, these ref uh, uh, people are already considering multiple mechanisms in a typical regression, right? In a typical regression, you have uh, expertise, independence, board size, et cetera, et cetera. But really, what is important, I guess, is to consider that there are interaction effects between these uh, characteristics, right? So it's, it's difficult to model that, but perhaps you can explain that in, in uh, that uh, this can inform empirical choices in which you start adding covariates that are not only additive or multiplicative, right? Because different combos have different values. And now there is a problem, right? That you can have equivalent combos, three of a kind of uh, number three red and three of a kind of number three black, right? And this is where different companies may choose different choices for random things like uh, where they started on time. So maybe it will be good to sort of think in that way and either explore that in the model or explain that in the paper that it's just uh, yeah, so I think that's a good point. Those interactive effects are clearly are important. Um, you know, understanding those conditional effects are important. And I think the problem is even more complicated than the one that you were raising, because at least in a poker game, we're all solving the same problem. We're all trying to get the highest hand we can get with the same rules. But when you look cross-sectionally at firms, like we were talking about before, some firms have a founder that has dual class shares. Some firms have a new CEO that's that's been brought in to solve certain problems. Some firms have a long-standing CEO that is hard to, to get out. Some firms have a hard time getting independent directors, maybe because of the business they're in. So, you know, it's a it's you know that they're you know having three of a kind might be really good in one game, but having three of a kind in another game might not be as good. So it's a really complicated problem. I'm not saying that we've solved it. I'm not saying it's solvable in six months or a year. 
I'm just trying to get people to think about the very points you and Fabrizio and others are raising, that, that it is complicated, there's interactive effects, there's different clusters that might solve the same problem, and then maybe start thinking about how we collectively get at the answers to those questions. Sure, thanks. All right, thank you. So we'll end it here. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin and Wayne, for your time presenting your work. I actually much enjoyed this, you know, two-speaker seminar. Uh, I think it's really cool. So we probably will be doing this more in the future. Uh, thank you, thank well. you, everyone, for joining, asking questions. If you have any question or comment, please email them to the authors of the paper. Uh, and uh, hopefully to see you next week. Yeah, Again. I'll put the recording up as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Take care. Have a nice weekend.